Hi, I'm Graham Glenn, Assistant Provost and Executive Director for Teaching and Learning Plus Technology at Stony Brook University. And this is Innovations in Education. In our show, we feature faculty and staff using innovative approaches and best practices to teaching and applications of educational technology that have had a positive effect on student learning. In this show, I'm joined by Gary Marr, who's an associate professor in the philosophy department at Stony Brook University. He's also a recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. We will be discussing problem-based learning and building student confidence in classes. Gary, welcome to the show. Welcome. Tell me a little bit about the classes that you teach. Well, I teach uh, classes in philosophy, ranging from logic to courses in Asian American history to courses in philosophy of religion to courses in philosophy of science and mathematics. Okay. You've done some radical things in your teaching of logic. Can you tell me how you've developed your logic lab and how, it, how it's different from most logic courses? Uh, well, let's see. I guess uh, it was out of necessity that I learned how to teach logic. I, I've, I began when I was at UCLA as a grad student and wrote a logic book with a professor there, Don Kalish. And that was the reason for getting a grant here before I started at Stony Brook for a logic lab. So we use uh, a logic lab for the teaching of logic that's key to the textbook, um, which is one of the three classic textbooks in logic. Okay. For, for those who are not in the field of philosophy, can you define what logic is and what a logic class teaches? <coughs> well, uh, logic, you might define it as a model of deductive thinking. And uh, what it does is imparts a skill to students that teaches them how to improve the overall form of their thinking. It's like if you were playing a golf game, uh, one way to improve your game would be to improve your swing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, logic, in a sense, uh, teaches the student how to organize their thoughts, how to think logically, and therefore carries over to help them to be successful in their other classes. Okay. So you use problems and, and challenges to the students to help teach uh -huh. them how to think. Can you tell us a little bit how you do that? Well, <coughs> well, it began with my lifelong love of puzzles, which began actually elementary school because I was put into a, um, a, a gifted program in the summer where they started, you know, g introducing us to logic puzzles. Mm -hmm. And so one of this is one of the books that I had uh, since elementary school. It's a Martin Gardner's first book of scientific American puzzles, and I've always been inspired um, by the usefulness of puzzles as teaching. And in the introduction. He talks about, you know, why have so many creative mathematicians and logicians been interested in puzzles? Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, for example, uh, Euler began the field of topology by looking at a puzzle about bridge crossing in Kundersberg. Or um, Alan Turing, um, who broke the Enigma Code during World War II, um, talked about a 15 puzzle and unsolvable puzzles. Okay. And uh, Albert Einstein had his uh, library stocked with with the mathematical puzzles and games. And <coughs> Martin Gardner said, uh, this has always inspired me, he said, uh, the interest of these great minds in mathematical play is not hard to understand, for the creative thought bestowed on such trivial topics is of a piece with the type of thinking which leads to mathematical and scientific discovery. What is mathematics, after all, except the solving of puzzles? And what is science if it's not a systematic effort to get better and better answers to puzzles posed by nature? And he goes on and he talks about the pedagogical value. Right? When people get hooked on a puzzle, they want to solve it, it carries over to them getting excited about the class. Mm -hmm. So somehow you're challenging your students, are you giving them games or puzzles in your class? Yeah, that's part of it, but it's uh, not just for the point of the puzzle, it's the element of playfulness. You know, because okay. once they start to play and enjoy they end up actually investing more of their time and energy I in the class. Have, have you ever gotten hooked on a puzzle? And you really wanted to solve it? And I tried Rubik's Cube for a while and <laughs> got a little frustrated. <laughs> well, yeah, this, well, this is uh, something last semester. One of my students did Rubik's Cube. She brought it in and I said, you know, I'd like to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, and so she ended up bringing a couple of chess sets in and chess clocks. And so we started introducing on Fridays, you know, students coming in and doing their logic homework in the logic lab, but also there would be things like the Rubik's Cube or games like Go or chess games. 
And what I found uh, was what the experts in education have said, is that you know, when you have students that are struggling to succeed, you don't cut off extracurricular activities. It's those extracurricular activities that gives them the motivation to actually do better in their other subjects. And I found that it worked just that way in the logic lab. Women students, for example, who typically don't do good in mathematics and that sort of thing because of various reasons uh, having nothing to do with being a woman, uh, actually stayed, uh, played uh, what we call Siamese chess or bug house, and, and they would stay in, you know, hours. And, and it would be a good role model for other students, you know, that they were succeeding and doing well at games like chess mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So, for example, the Rubik's Cube. How would you te use the Rubik's Cube to teach logic? Well, <coughs> what's interesting about the, the Rubik's Cube is that um, it can be solved using algorithms, right? So the, uh, the learning of algorithms, I it was important. Uh, the idea was developed by Alan Turing, who, um, uh, like I say, broke the Enigma code. His, his dissertation advisor was my dissertation advisor. I was the last student of the great uh, 20th century logician Alonzo Church. And this whole idea of algorithmic um, uh, problem solving uh, really was given its uh, computational foundations by Turing. And uh, without that, we probably would have lost World War II. You mm. know, without uh, breaking the Enigma code, right. you wouldn't have had that uh, extra information that helped the uh, Allied forces to win. But uh, <coughs> understanding what an algorithm is, and then also understanding that's not all what we want to get out of logic, is learning an algorithm. Because just instantiating an algorithm doesn't make you understand anything at all. But it does uh, help you to, to see th how the reasoning process c can be formalized. And that's uh, led to some of the most important results in the 20th century of logic. And that th those are the Gödel theorems uh, to show that algorithmic thinking is limited, you know, that, that uh, we can prove that there are statements of arithmetic that are unprovable but are nevertheless true if arithmetic is consistent. And so that sort of these results, uh, although these seem very formal, have many philosophical implications and um, that's what Gödel wanted to do. He was a very reclusive logician, um, one of Einstein's walking companions uh, the last uh, at the Institute for Advanced Physics. 